So basic life support, as I sort of touched on earlier, is um, chest compressions and ventilation. So our chest compressions are basic life support. So we want to give 100 to 120 chest compressions a minute. Um, and we want to make sure that we have, as we're compressing our chest, our arms are locked and straight. We've got our hand um, over the other and we are our back straight as we give our full body pressure into this dog's chest or cat's, well, mainly a dog's chest. Um, and we're going to be thinking about, we want to make sure as we give chest compressions, we let a space to recoil. So as we um, compress the chest, we lift off the patient and allow that chest to recoil. And depending on the size and the like um, confirmation of our patient, we need to think whether what type of um, chest compression we're going to do. So this can be a cardiac pump, thoracic pump, or it can be like a sternal compression um, over um, the sternum as well. So with our um, we want to, with our cardiac and thoracic pumps, we want to compress the chest to um, sort of thirty to fifty percent, um, and a bit less, so like twenty five percent with sternal compressions, because that's obviously they've got lots of um, sort of for their ribs and their heart and their lungs can be more damaged if we're going to compress really hard in those areas as well. And as I said earlier, basic life support is the bread and butter of CPR. We really need to make sure that we have got this down and we are giving effective chest compressions to perfuse our patient. So if we're not perfusing our patient properly, we really, really won't stand the chance of getting this patient back. So really important that we're going to get this patient um, perfused properly. And being effective at our chest compressions increases our rate, our chance of getting return of spontaneous circulation as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we can swap out if we're tired. So ideally, as we said, you know, it takes one minute to get to optimum blood flow with good chest compressions. And um, we want to do a two minute cycle. So if you can reach one minute, I think like it's very difficult if you've got different members of your team who um, are capable of going for two minutes, that's great. But again, we want to make sure those chest comp compressions are effective. And obviously we can measure that by looking at our entire CO2 and feeling crudely our pulse quality. So our thoracic pump, we'll get, so this is in large round chested dogs. And as I said, we are gonna go over the widest part of the thorax, but our back straight arm locked. Um, and we wanna generate a pulse in these, our patients. Um, and again, so again, people who maybe not done CPR before, they feel like they thought, oh, there's a pulse, but obviously we're generating that pulse. So obviously bear in mind that we want to feel a pulse while we're doing chest compressions. And once we pause for that two minute break in our cycle, if there's no pulse, we're gonna just carry on our chest compressions. So we're gonna hopefully generate um, some, you know, CO2 by perfusing our cells. So obviously our, you know, cells with that anaerobic respiration, they're gonna produce CO2 as waste. So we wanna make sure we're perfusing it as best we can um, through our thoracic pump. Um, and generate a good um, entire CO2. And again, you may find you have to uh, adjust your position. So obviously um, in humans, our bodies are right sort of similar sizes um, and the conformation is very standardless. Obviously perhaps we're bigger, smaller, um, but in animals, this is where it gets tricky and um, we sometimes do have to make adjustments for our chest compressions. Um, and maybe it do slight, slight movements to get the best output we can because they're all not, again, they're all not the same shape and size, which makes it tricky. So don't be afraid to sort of move your hands around. Um, but again, over the, for the thoracic pump over the widest part of the thorax. But again, cardiac pump. So this can be um, in sort of small cats, dogs, and also in large keel chested uh, dogs. So we're thinking about our sight hounds. So obviously, we don't need to go over the wise part of the thorax. We can probably compress the heart better over the apex of the heart. Um, and this, obviously, in a large dog, you can do this with two hands. In small cats or dogs, we're going to be thinking we're not doing two hands anymore. We are one-handed, like two thumbs, um, heel of the hand. And this, again, we want this generator pulls and generate some CO2 within our patient to move that we are perfusing the patient's cells within the body appropriately. Um, 
And again, as I said, the two hand compressions are no longer recommended um, in our small patients. So again, big dog, um, we've got Rachel here doing um, our cardiac pump um, with our nice straight back, arms locked. And then this is our um, sort of two thumb over our uh, little feline patient here. Again, so we're putting our hands underneath and our thumbs at the top and just pressing down. And again, we still want to try and like leave room for recoil so that's something to remember um, and to remember to pace yourself as well um, and obviously we have lots of like theme tunes can't we that we can uh, do our um, 100 to 120 beats per minute to and obviously um, Recover have a lovely app that has a good metronome on it um, for this for CPR which I recommend that you download and I've got a clip a little picture of that uh, on a later slide but um it can be easy, especially with, I think, the two thumb compressions get carried away and either go too quickly um, and you will fatigue quicker um, as a, someone giving compressions uh, if you're going too quick. Um, you can also use the heel of your hand. So I've got, oh, that's a one-handed one there. So yeah, that's the hardest one I'd say to do, one-handed uh, chest compression. If you've got really good arms, then go for it but this one I think um where so you can't really see Rachel's hand but it's tucked underneath the other side of the cat and then she's leaning her hand over um the over the apex of the heart and pushing down um and that's quite a, a good one so yeah two two thumb and the um heel of the hand over the um as a cardiac pump was very effective as well and for sternal compression, so we are looking at our wide-chested dogs, so our brachycephalics, basically, um, and they are in like dorsal recumbency. We are only compressing like 25, like quarter of this patient's chest, and we're using two hands. So again, we'll try our best. Um, you may need other people to help stabilise this patient, stop it from moving around. Um, Again, on this model, he wasn't going to move very far, but again, in real life, your patient's going to be very floppy um, and may need some sandbags or people to help stabilise it. Um, and um, I found sometimes in brachies, um, we will do this compression, but sometimes we have to switch to um, cardiac pump. Um, so you may find that you do all three of these types of compressions, because again, Brachycephalics come in all shapes and sizes. They like, you know, French bulldogs come in different shapes and sizes, English bulldogs. Um, so, uh, you know, Boston Terriers and things like that. So again, try and tailor it as best you can to your patient to get the maximum um, cardiac uh, output through measuring iron tidal CO2 as we can. So we've talked about chest compressions and now we're talking about um, our airway still within our basic life support. And again, this is all happening in a very quick amount of time with our patient, but we ideally would like a laryngoscope to visualize our airway. We're gonna have our ET tube that's cuffed, and we're gonna have some tie to tie that tube in with. There's been a lot of times, and again, where closed communication has failed. Um, I've seen in teams, and we've before we've tied that tube in, we've started chest compressions, and that tube's just gone that's come right out of that patient. So um, important that we, once we've intubated our patient, we tie the tube in and we cuff it as well. So a lot of these patients, if they have got systemic um, disease and they're really unwell, um, may have pulmonary edema and things like that. So that may just all like come out of the tube as well, um, which you, your suction will come in really handy for. Um, and again, that's they can be quite tricky then to get an untidal CO2 on those ones. Um, but to bear in mind that that, is a, a likely to happen um, in very sick patients. Um, having an ambi bag is really um, easier than wheeling in your big anaesthetic machine. Um, and I think if you're already under um, anaesthesia and you have an anaesthetic machine already attached, you're not gonna then switch it to an ambi bag. But again, if you're in the ward and it's part of your crash um, cart or crash box, you have an ambi bag in there. Um, that'll, that'll really make your life a lot easier and you have piped oxygen. You can just connect your ambi bag to your flow regulator and just click it in um, and be ready to go. Um, we wanna do one breath every six seconds. So again, as you talked about chest compressions, people get carried away, maybe go a bit too quick and the metronome is really helpful. 
on the app, the Recover app as well, they do have a breath sound on there as well. You can utilize or you can switch it off if you don't like the sound of the breath sound. Um, but we want to give um, one breath every six seconds, so that's 10 breaths a minute. So um, I um, do my CPR training. I think it's quite nice to actually envision like you're counting. You give a breath, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the breath. And it seems very slow, but if you're going too quickly, we're not going to get a nice trace on our capnography and we're not going to be able to see what's going on with our patient, how well we are compressing this patient's chest.